All right, welcome everyone. Thank you much, so much to everyone who's joined us here in person and online. Um, my name is Laura Kruger. I work at the David Rumsey Map Center and I will short, show a short land acknowledgement video and then hand it over to Justin who will give introductions. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Alakma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Good afternoon. Welcome. Let's see if I'm visible. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, most of me. Oh, boy. All right. Welcome to everyone here in person and welcome to those online. I'm Justin Leidwanger. I'm faculty in the Department of Classics and I'm the assistant director of the Stanford Archaeology Center. Salim Mohammed unfortunately could not be here today. He's ill, but I know he's here in spirit and very excited for this to happen today. It's my pleasure, it's a real pleasure to, today to introduce our honored guests and presenters, Larry Regatol and Alston Kellen. Larry Regatol is co-founder of Wa'age, a nonprofit organization in Yap that works with communities to promote cultural heritage of the Rimital indigenous people of, of, in the Central Caroline Islands. He also serves as Wa'age president and as a volunteer instructor in the traditional Yapis seafaring system, teaching canoe carving and celestial navigation. Regatol is an accomplished Senap master canoe carver initiated under the traditional school of Tan Getch. He also was initiated through the Po ritual as a traditional navigator under the master school of Wei Yang. Alston Kalen has been involved in the traditional canoeing culture of the Marshall Islands for decades. He, for years, he has assisted the project Wan Ailong Kane, or Canoes of These Islands, to document the step-by-step -step construction of Marshallese canoes. In the late 1990s, he co-founded the program Wan Ailong in Module, a nonprofit that focuses on using traditional Marshallese skills as a medium to foster life skills and capacity building for the youth of the Marshall Islands. The presentation by Larry and Olson helps us kick off a new exhibit here at the David Rumsey Map Center entitled Imagining Maritime Spaces. This exhibit draws together maps of the world's oceans and seas to explore how cartographers, navigators, and others have historically and today still come to know and to represent these dynamic spaces. Charts, tools, and other visualizations illustrate aspects of navigation by stars, winds, and waves, exploration of unknown waters and depths, and shifting coasts, past, present, and future. We saw many of you wandering around earlier, and we welcome you to continue exploring later until February 10th at least, um, and online we're hoping as well soon through a, a spotlight exhibit. Let me here take this opportunity to publicly thank my co-curators, Beth Minnie and Nicole Constantine, as well as Christina Larson for all her hard work coordinating and mounting the exhibit, Salim Mohammed for his encouragement and support throughout, and uh, Laura Kruger and Mike Keller for helping us really pull this together today. And of course, David Rumsey, who I think is joining us on Zoom, I'm told. Various members of the workshop, Computational Archaeology and Seafaring Theater, Theory, which is, are here today, um, offered ideas and thoughtful contributions to the exhibit, and we're grateful to each of them. Most importantly, our guests and presenters, Larry and Olson, have generously contributed to this effort with their own stick charts and star compass. And having them here today to share with us this is a genuine treat. Mogatin, Larry, and Yakwe Olson, and welcome to Stanford. We're honored to have you here, and we thank you for taking the time to share your stories and knowledge with the group here in this building and online. And I ask you all to please join me in welcoming Larry Nolson for the role of canoe building and navigation in Yappies and Marshallese navigation, seafaring systems. Thank you very much, Justin, for the introduction. Oh. 
Um, I'm getting bounced back on maybe a mic somewhere. Let me at the outset first, technical difficulties. But... Test, oh, that works. <laughs> Let me first um, thank you for the honor for us to be here today to present for you. Um, I think when I saw the video and I also read the program um, of this workshop, I am very proud of Stanford uh, for having as the first order of business, the recognition of the indigenous people of this land. Um, I would also like in our own way to pay our tribute and to seek permission uh, from the indigenous ancestors who first settled here um, to ask them permission if we could uh, proceed, Alson and I. And I will do so in my own local vernacular and also to do a tribute of a chant uh, that I will um, uh, also explain for you. So please bear with me. Suro, Suro Rang, Suro Tittar, Suro Tamon Fadiwe. Madonna Gayo, Till long old and me, Matawi, Matoani, Kayolanga, Matoani, Gamanga, Matoani, get you, get you, Matoani, Gamorga, Morga, Sam, Thank you. Let's see if this works. So maybe I should clear this so you could see, but today we hope after our hospital and recognition, just to give you a little bit of what the brief, the rundown of our talk would be. I would be talking about, of course, give you a little bit of not that you don't know, but some background on the map, where we come from, and give you some context to that area. And then, of course, I will also be talking about the island wisdom that we know in our traditional seafaring, honing in on three important aspects of it. <laughs> For us, our seafaring system comprises or it's a very complex thing that it doesn't just mean for a navigator to sail off on a canoe. Rather, it's, as we like to put it, it's a, imagine a canoe that has 10 different crew on it. And each of those crew comes from a different walk of life the, with the certain expertise that are critical to seafaring, hence a system. So I will focus on three of those crew members. Um, and 
and then I will end off with um, Alson doing talk on the stick chart as well. Here is my translation of the chant that I, I just performed for you. We call it Sumatao. And after paying respect and asking permission for, for us in the islands, when we go on a voyage prior to entering the ocean, we ask also permission from the ocean for, for it to allow us to traverse. <clears throat> Here is the area of what we know as Micronesia, which is from as far west as Palau to as far east as the Marshall Islands, where Alson come from, far down south as Kiribati, and then of course the Marianas up north are also part of that geographical location, Micronesia. Right here on the globe, I've heard somebody use the analogy of like, if you're just looking at this space, you could take the whole US continent and put it in there and be fit right in the area. But if you're just talking about landmass, you combine all of those who are just about the size of Rhode Island. So you can appreciate now the space, the ocean, that comprises all of these so many thousands of islands for us. Let me take you further to where I come from, which is the island of Lamatric. That's where I grew up. It's nothing more than 0.5 square miles with about seven feet, the highest point on that island above sea level. 28 different households and about 300 people. So my business, you can guess whose business it is. It's everyone's. That is where I was raised and that is where my roots are. And that's my home called Lama Trek. So let's now look at the seafaring system. This is, by the way, a canoe that I had carved and worked with some of the apprentices and finished off with the community of Lamatric. I said earlier, the crew of that canoe should be 10, ideally. And so we have a spot over here, this is the outrigger, that we should have three people on there. And those three people consist of the thinker, the master carver, and the engineer guy. Right. And then, of course, on the main canoe itself, the weatherman, the fortune teller, or the or oracle reader, and then the navigator. And then out there are all the spiritual folks, the healer, the masseuse, and the chief. So ideally, as I said, you should have all these 10 crew combine into one. So if you aspire to become a seafarer in our islands, it would be ideal for you to know any, as best as you can from all these 10 different skills. So a navigator, of course, might be at the pinnacle, but he will never be a navigator if he doesn't have that canoe. So he needs to be also a master canoe carver. He cannot be a master canoe carver if he doesn't know how to build the hut or the canoe house or the techniques that require for you to ride this canoe, hence the engineer. They are all interdependent. I'll focus on the three yellow ones because that's currently what I'm doing at the University of Guam, teaching the Island Wisdom Center, the, the um, certificate program for Micronesian seafaring system. Just those three, because you can imagine if, I, if we um, look at all these 10 and you aspire to become a navigator, you can be sure that your learning is going to be a lifetime as it is for me. 
uh, it continues for as long as possible. But it all began somewhere. And so for me, that's the canoe house where it begins, the story begins. Just like when I was growing up, I found myself in a canoe house at the age of four or five and start learning from the elders. And of course, the last thing on my mind after being thrown in the ocean for getting seasick from an older guy is that I would never ever become a seafarer. Big mistake, <laughs> obvious. So the, those three individuals are the Taubang, as we call him, who's the engineer who would begin by building this classroom, harvesting all the local materials. This is a project that I started um, after finishing the canoe two months ago. So two months ago, we started harvesting all our materials. Those are telephone poles, by the way. So the idea of meshing the best of both worlds is important. <clears throat> And then my students who work with me start digging and putting the post down. And again, construction, bringing up nothing on this, on this canoe house is nailed. It's all local materials harvested from Guam and lashed together. These are all students from the university, my apprentice students and then learning to make the thatch roofs out of local nipa leaves we call them and when i left last few days ago it's done so we have now our canoe house that we're going to start uh, continue our learning in. For the other walk, for the other um, important individual on that canoe, being the master carver, that's his canoe. He also needs to understand the land and the sea, just like the Taobang needs to understand how to harvest trees. So is this walk of life. He must learn about the land and about the sea in order for him to get the craft. The, the canoe picture that you saw earlier was actually this. When we first harvested and start building, carving. This is a local mahogany log that we have to, our trees are small not like you have big trees. So we just need to get what we call the heart of the canoe, which is the keel. And that's that. Because once we have the heart of the canoe, we can then protrude the ending, put attach the ends, and start planking it up as high as we can. So that picture there shows you how that canoe has been planked up. And we have, these are canoes that we depend on today. The navigator and his element, or within his element, you could see that our canoes are obviously not the most comfortable canoes. I like to compare my canoes to others as mine being, there is being the Cadillac, I'm riding a wheelbarrow. <coughs> There is no space for you. There's no place for you to hide from the rain or no place for you to hide from the sun. When it rains, you're poured onto. And when it's hot, you uh, endure the heat. But nevertheless, when the moment is right and when the sun is cool, this good news, it's like the best thing you could ever ask for. Here, the navigator needs to understand the land, the ocean, and the skies. We are now 
turning even up to the upward and the current to understand where we're going. Hence the idea of the star compass that you see in front of you that will be displayed. I just wanted to emphasize that for this, this piece that you will be seeing today, our orientation and our concept of direction is that wherever I sit, if I'm sitting here, even though I know that north is there because I snuck out of the hotel last night and check where the star is, the Polaris star, so I know it's there <laughs> for the purpose of this, north is there. And the reason is because whenever we roll out this mat to teach navigation, I am where it all begins. And my back of my head is always to the east, to the sunrise. And where I look is to the sunset. So there is where the sun is going down, even though I know from sneaking out to the hotel, outside the hotel, is that it sits there. I also want to point out that this has been the beginning of teaching our apprentices the star compass. Now, there, the original ones were squared, but now we, we put it in a circle also, but it, either way, it's fine. You will see that there are four main points here, this being the east, wherever, depending on wherever I, if I sit on that, that becomes the east because it's relative to my students. Yeah. And I start here, I go to Polaris on here and the Southern Cross here. Because where we are relative to the equator, we get to see the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. Last night, I can tell you the Polaris is way too high because yeah. I'm really far North. And when I explain sometimes to my, my teachers, my elders, that the Polaris is about midway up the sky, it freaks them out. Yeah. Or when I say when I was down at ANU Australia and I actually saw the Southern Cross, the Crux, upside down, they couldn't believe it. That's because it's too high up. But for us on the equator, it gets to sit and all the stars go up and they sit with the exception of course of Polaris because Polaris we also call it in our language which means the star that doesn't move but it's we also have a second name for it which is the thief and I'm not sure why our ancestors identify Polaris as the thief the only thing I can think of is that it stays up all night. Yeah. It's going to go to somebody's house and steal some food. Or maybe even steal somebody's wife. I don't know. <laughs> now, for part of our star of learning the stars and learning how we end of our canoe and back of our canoe, we have this which is a memorization of every point that my canoe heads to from one given spot. So in this case, Guam. I'm sitting on Guam and I can give you all the directions, 32 different directions of rising stars and setting stars and give you what's under there, whether it's a land, whether it's a coral, it's a reef, submerged reef, or animals, fish, or bird. And this, we call it bugof or ofani, which is to see land. So for every single island in Micronesia, we have this, each of them, and we're going to be crisscrossing. So here again, you see some of my students learning navigation. And I said that part of this learning of seafaring, we think of it as like the actual sailing part is 85% of the work. I mean, 15, the most of it 
<clears throat> requires other stuff, including all the rituals, all the preparations, all the ceremonies to get people to voyage. So we did two rituals recently. We initiated some navigators and we also finished and launched our canoes. And these are some of the students from the university, as well as the young ones from the Horal School. She's the first of our initiated navigator of Chamorro descent of the Marianas and been initiated as a navigator. She too is a um, PhD, a doctor, <laughs> a graduate of UCLA. So I will conclude with this concept of island wisdom of our classroom. That HUD. Our classroom doesn't have four walls. Our classroom begins with the land. And all that we can understand about the land from the trees to the crabs. In fact, the gafas is the name of that crab. And there's only one of it that we name it that. And we can find it under what star that it needs to be found. Our classroom means the ocean. And uh, we have the albino swordfish, you know, <laughs> whose name is uh, Igabuch, and only him gets that name. And we can point you to the star that we can find. That's it. And of course, the sky. And the hataf that belongs to Rugeden is our frigate bird that is very prominent in traditional seafaring and navigation. So I will now turn it over to my brother, Alson, who will then take the opportunity to talk and explain about beautiful Marshall Islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larry, for the opening chant and the introduction. I actually, this is my only slides. So that means you have no questions. <laughs> actually, um, what Larry has explained is what we went through um, as it was explained that I, we I was involved with the documentary part of our uh, program project where we document the tradition the step-by-step -step construction of canoes and uh, the knowledge the chant the songs and all that so what larry was showing in his uh slideshows very similar to what we went through uh, but we actually documented them and um put them in reports and books where um we wanted to make sure that it's not lost. Of course, when we went out to do it, people were laughing. Why do you want to do it? Because it's part of their life. It's their life. So why document something that it's already, you know, I mean, we use it every day. So we never thought that it was important for us to document it. Um, of course, some of the islands in the Marshalls, uh, lost the uh the tradition the skills because during world war ii the japanese would came to, you know came to the marshals and of course colonization before that and the japanese came in uh during world war ii and make sure that all the canoe builders don't build more canoes and all the navigators don't navigate anymore because they knew that the american soldier or the navy were close by and that's pretty much how a lot of the, you know, uh, the war happening in the South Pacific happened. You know, the traditional people would go out and do the scouting work. Uh, so we, um, while we were documenting the stories, I mean, the skills, I myself was asking us, you know, I was really interested because a lot of the, a lot of the islands that we went to, the kids would come in. A lot of kids 
came in through the sites and they were, and of course I was very excited because I was, that was like 30 years ago, you know, I had hair. So, and I felt so good because, you know, I, I thought that there were, there was, you know, the enthusiasm, they really want to be the part of the, the program. So one day I asked the elders, what's, you know, what's with the kids, you know, they uh, you know, that they, I, I know that they're interested, but why do they come in every day? I said, oh, you know, in order to go to high school level, you need to take the entry test. And you can see the Marshall Islands, if you live in Ujilang, which is almost 600 miles uh, to Majuro, if you don't pass that test, is education is pretty much there, you know. That's the end of it. And a lot of the kids don't pass the test. And if you go to high school, which is Majuro, Jialuit here, and Wajie and Kwajalein, that's where they have the main high schools. So if you don't pass the test, you don't go to those schools. So you can imagine how many kids don't pass the test. And if you pass the test, a lot of the kids would go to school, but then the parents are not there. So life is not easy. So a lot of them end up drop out. So they go back to their home islands. So when I was explained, when people explained that to me, I was in tears because I never thought that that was the situation. So when, and I was in the Outer Islands. My last project was two years long, almost two years. Uh, we were building this 40, 48 foot canoe. Uh, and we had the ceremony. And I said, well, why don't you give a speech? So I stood on the canoe and I gave a little you know, thank you speech. And I said, when I get home, I'm going to start a school. And this school will base on the only thing that I know is going to building. Not that I didn't know that it would take forever to start the school. It was easier done than, you know, said than done. But that's how we started the program that I'm running. One Island Module, as was explained. We brought in the kids. Well, we sailed. Uh, the voyaging canoe that we built from uh, from Ujjayi to Kwajalein and all the way to Madro, which is about good 300 miles, 100 miles to Kwajalein and another 200, 300 miles to Madro. So that kind of excited me. And when I got back, you know, we kind of bring in the kids from the same you know, who had this same unfortunate uh, lifestyle. And we start sailing the canoe. And one day, uh, a gentleman came to me and he says, hey, can you give me a ride? So I said, sure. So we gave him a ride and he said, Kim, tell me the story. What, what's going on here? Give me a voyaging canoe. And so I told him the same story I'm telling you today about these kids. On the way back, it says, uh, by the way, my name is Ambassador Perryhead. I'm the ambassador for, you know, Australian ambassador to Micronesia. I said, man, you know what? I've never met an ambassador before. <laughs> it says, I give you three days. Why didn't you write me a grant? Sure. My office was maybe about this big. I had one of those older Apple computer, kind of deep. And uh, one of those wide printers, I go, well, every time you print, like, rrr, 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 rrr. so he came back and he says, hey, you know what? Where's my uh, proposal? I says, should I write, dear sir, or dear, it may concern. He says, you haven't passed that, right? He said, no. Nah. I'm a canoe builder. I tell story. We call it I don't write. He says, okay, I'll write it for you, but you stand $1,000. During that time, I was, you know, 
See, I went to high school in Hawaii. That's where, you know, I saw Hokulea and all those big canoes. So I had a friend named Dr. Andrew Kinyuki of Land Grant uh, working at the college. So I ran to him and he said, because he said, if you give me $10, I'll match it. I'll give you 20 100 I'll give you 200 So I ran to his room, knock on the door, gave him this $10,000 check. And he says, what is that? I said, it's a check. I said, yeah. What is it for? I said, what happened to 10, 20, 200, 200? It says, well, you know, you have to uh, write a proposal. I said, how come the Australian gave it to me and I didn't have to write it? And you Americans want me to write it. He says, okay, I help you out. And that's when the dream came true. We started the Wine Island in Majo Canoe Program. So the program right now, I mean, what we've been doing is we've been recruiting uh, the same folks that I promised that I would build a school for. Uh, we, because of the space, we could only take 25 kids. Um, of course, I feel like I'm playing God sometimes because I have to choose which kid should be part of this program. In the program, we teach um, English and math. We teach basic carpentry and of course, the tradition. We try to make sure, especially right now, we have this relationship with the college that every kids that graduate from the uh, program, they are halfway with their schooling to get their GED level uh, certification. I have um, kids now, they're working on their bachelor's degree from college, AS degrees, and, and a lot of kids are in school. I mean, in, in, they have job now, they have families. So we have used uh, the traditional knowledge to open the another door of opportunities for these kids. And they're so fascinated about it. They, they don't even know that they're learning math, but majoring the different parts of the canoes, like my finger, we use different part of the fingers, different part of our body to build the canoes. They do not they don't know that they're actually learning geometry. So when they do open the tape measure and they cut different planks, because we have no big trees, so we sew our uh, canoes together. They don't know that they're actually learning carpentry, but that's actually part of it. We had to go back to school and be to become counselors. We feel that it's important to, when you give skills, you need to give life skills with it, especially with these kids. But the most important thing is they're learning through the tradition of canoe building and sailing. So it's really interesting for them. I make sure that I have a special relationship with the newspaper. So I make sure that their faces are on the, in the newspaper all the time. So more and more are interested in the program. So they're like, they become role models. The program now, anytime there is an event around the world, the program represents the Marshall Islands. In March, I was in Dubai. We built a canoe and it's in the, the museum there. Um, we've been in South Korea. We've been in Taiwan, here, Sweden, uh, in uh, Geneva. We've been all over the world, representing the country. And every time that we go out, we make sure that all these kids are you know, are posted on Facebook and so they become role models. And some of them have, you know, their parents, when they first bring them to the program, they says, 
Yeah, that's my little rascal. But keep seeing them in that, in the newspaper and social media, it changes from my little rascal to my son. And one of the th greatest thing that we do is we host uh, canoe races. And in canoe races is really big in the marshals. So I make sure that I put some of those kids in, the, in those races. And every other kids want to be part of the program. We used, before we had kids 14 to 20, you know, 14, as low as 14, then the kids from the high schools want to drop get, you know, want to drop out of school just so that they can come to the program. So I said, we'll raise it to 18 because we want to keep them there. So Larry was talking about navigation and of course the boast ceremony in Yap and some of the chant in Yap, they have connection to the marshals. We're all connected. And in some of the chant, they mentioned the islands in the marshals, and other activities. In the marshals, the we uh, the legend has it that navigation came from the island of spirit, and the island of spirit is the island of Ep. Look at the uh, the the uh, map of Micronesia. The only Ep there is Yap. So a lot of people believe that the, the navigation came in from Yap. I sail on. Uh, Makali from uh, on a Hawaiian canoe from Hawaii through Micronesia, it's about 20 some hundred miles. But on that voyage, the great navigator, that master navigator that shared his knowledge with all Micronesian and the Polynesian, Ma Piaida was there. And he told me the story that navigation, uh, there were seven navigating school in Micronesia, uh, and one of them went to Yap from the Marshals. So there was a connection between Marshallese navigation to Yapi's navigation, and from Yap back to the Marshals. So two women came in from Yap, and um, they said, okay, all we have is navigation. So you go to that island, you go to Namrik, one of the small island, um, right here, go to Namrik, and I go to uh, one of the island. So if they treat you good, you teach them navigation. If not, then you just leave. So one of them actually was treated well. So she shared the knowledge of navigation. And the first person she taught was her own son, Langin. So Langin, in in our um, in part of our navigation is a chant we call Igor. So the Igor shows uh, all the uh, kakala, what we call kakala, the sign in the water or the birds or different type of fish flying different direction which shows you what where the islands are. The Langin actually have a chant that shows and tells different direction and where every uh, every one of the uh, the signs are, including birds, fish. So This is the Marshall Islands. Seven hundred and fifty thousand square miles is in this sticks, with twenty nine atolls, and five of the atolls are actually islets. Uh, island, there's no island. It's like rocks in the middle of the ocean, and. In this big ocean is 1,150 
uh, small islands, all scattered around 750,000 square miles. And I think uh, the land mass is only 1%. So you can see that it is very important for us, transportation is very important is for us. Every single islet or atoll have up to 50, 60 islets within. So if you want to get medicine, you, you need a canoe. If you want to get school supplies, you need a canoe. So that's why navigation is very, very important for us. So you can see uh, you can see Ebon is right here, all the way to Bikini and Rongolan. And this is Mili around here and Majuro. So each of these sticks represent different currents and swells, like Namrik. Namrik is here, Jaluit and Kili and Ebon is here. So there is a current that goes here. So every one of these have, um, have uh, different, they represent different swells and currents within the Marsa Islands. Uh, Larry was explaining about the navigation, uh, the star navigation, but we do swell navigation. So uh, we also do uh, star navigation, but uh, this this stick chart focuses on swell navigation. So where the three sticks, this is the west, and up is north. So this is the compass. What I just showed you is the. Uh, the map. So this is the compass. Now these things, uh, of course, represent different swells. Do you need all this? That's why Larry is very important here. <laughs> so the swells that the swell here is Bungudo. This is east, west, north, south. So these are the four swells that we based our navigations on, north, south, east, west. So that's why it's easy, it's like the compass. So the, the, the swells from west, uh, from east is the strongest, and the swells from north, second strongest, and of course, south, and then west. The three, it's three sticks here. They represent the swells, so the reflection of water, the waves uh, patterns as you go out of an island. So this Chugai, Chugai, Ribugai, Chau Jaladai. So Chugai is the, when you're close to an island, it's a little bit more choppier. The further out you go is Ribugai. You can see it's kind of calmer. And the, when you're out there is you see a lot of big swells, but it's not as rough as when you are close to an island. So you're in the middle. So it depends. Uh, and of course, these are taught when you're young. When you're a baby, you put it in a small, uh, small canoe, and then you they put you close to the water and you kind of learn the uh, learn to feel the waves. And as you grow up, you start going on uh, on canoes, go fishing. And of course, when you get older and older, you start going out. But these are, you don't take out, you memorize, memorize these things and then you just go out. And I think, you know, if you can, if you memorize the whole map, it's in no mind. And then when you go out there, you feel 
uh, you feel the wave. I I took a couple trips, and um, I was kind of nervous. I didn't want to go during the day because when you go during the day, it's so confusing. The ocean is so confusing. And of course, because I'm still a student. So when I went out, I could feel uh, east, west. And I know what the island is already. But when I feel east, west, I can kind of uh, point out where I'm going. And I just kind of keep that in mind. And Joe went on my second, uh, well, we went on the second voyage. And these, these maps don't show you how close the islands are. It shows you where about the island. So, you know, of course, after being on a ship to these islands, we all know where the islands and how far they are. So I went, the first voyage I went with my, uh, well, I was the steerer for my, uh, for my uh, navigator. And I remember how, uh, how, how long it took. So on the second voyage, uh, we, as we were going out, we were supposed to wait a little bit, but we got so excited that we just went anyway. So I was kind of nervous that I would hit the island because I know where the island is, but uh, I know that if I go straight into that channel, that island, I would hit it because, you know, the time is, we went a little bit too far. So anyhow, this is called the Wabebe. And Wabebe mean floating canoe. Because it's obviously because it's floating, float out there and shows you where to go. And this is called metal, which mean ocean. So in the Marshall Island Ocean, you memorize and you learn all these things and then you use the, the compass. So that's my presentation. And as Larry, you know, he started with a chant. I'm gonna close with a small chant before we give you good people to give us uh, question, hope it's all multiple choice. So the chance goes, Gubaka nam rabbit charlim and nam papa don lot and nam kalo e copa nam walil, walil wajoro, li bella lua, charam chada jago. So it's like a magical chant when you go sailing, you said that and the canoe seemed to go faster. Or maybe. It makes you think that the canoe goes fast. So Kubaganam Rabichad is the how drinker flow to balance the canoe. So we always think about the canoe as our team, our family. So it's perfect even in our situation. We always make sure that there is something to balance the canoe. Lemonam Babaran is the bailer to bail out all the canoe into the water. So whatever you do in life. There's always challenges. But challenge is good. It's a good tool to make sure that you know that if that thing ever come back again, you know what to do. Go back and I'm ready to live in power and lot. Lot and I'm color. Lot represent our navigator. So our navigator, navigator look and already got the, uh, I mean, look into the future or already set the course and he knows where to go. And we just do our part and follow what he said. Two mimic, we said. Two mimic mean we stand and be alert and hop all night. So we just follow whatever the navigator says. Because every word that come out of his mouth is always in a good direction. And it takes you where you go. And if we go as a, a team, our voyage, our sail will be as fast as 
the lightnings in the heaven when it lights and go. So thank you very much. And como dada. Oh, see, I'm so excited about, I forgot. So this is uh, a food that we prepare. Our mothers prepare for the sons as they go on a voyage. And this will last years and years. It's made out of pantanus tree, uh, pantanus fruits. They cook it on the ground, bring them out, get the paste out of the pantanus fruits, and then they, uh, they dry it. So it's almost like gummy bear, but it doesn't, so it doesn't get rot. If these guys would live, we'd cut it up and have a little taste of it. Lucky uh, the custom didn't take it away. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Larry and Alston, both. I know we have questions from the audience, I'm sure, as well as online. And I would, I would love to have the opportunity, if we can, to, to send some of them your way. Please. I'm good with it. Okay, so I'm curious. Have you been on the longest journey, which looks like it's from Ibon to Taungi? So from the very bottom to the top. Because you were saying that when the it's just right, there's nothing like the feeling and well, I'm not on the water right now, but I want to understand as best as I can so that when I go out on the water, I can really remember. Just like uh, the feeling of a longish voyage. The uh, the longest voyage I ever took was from Ujjayi, Kwajalein, all the way to Madura, which is uh, about halfway through uh, the map. How long did that take? Oh, almost three days. Okay. Uh, but uh, it went fast because when we got close to Madro, the wind died. So it was super glassy, and um, we we would have drifted for you know for a while. Oh, by the way, at that time my wife was pregnant. So when we got in, she said, "We, you know, you have a daughter." I said, "Well, I'll name her. Uh, I'll name her uh, Walur." which mean canoe in a peaceful ocean. So, but yes, uh, it took us uh, about three days. I can get you. Hello. Uh, is there a cultural significance of uh, single-handed sailors like there is in Europe and the United States? Earlier you referenced, you know, that your ideal boat has 10 people on it. Um, and I've grown up with stories of, for example, Bernard Motizier or Vito Dumas, a lot of kind of the quintessential single-handed uh, sailors. Uh, I think that I would love to have that on these canoes. Unfortunately, though, the design of this canoe, um, the picture of the canoe that I showed you that car, that's only about 30 feet long. It weighs 1.5 ton. Um, but the rigging of it, you see the distinction, the difference of our canoes from the other canoe or other is that we shunt our canoes rather than we tag. That we actually physically lift that sail from this end and transfer it to this end. So we go this way, that way as we're sailing upwind. We don't go into the wind, right? So I think it would be nice if we could have our canoes with one man. But I also think it's going to be maybe actually impossible for various reasons. One is that it, it, you just, you need it for this kind of craft anyways. It would be important for you to have the, at least the very minimum, depending on the size, of a canoe. And if you're doing long distance foraging, at the very minimum five, if not four. And mind you, the 10 that I refer to wasn't like, it's just a symbolic thing, right? So that you could have five, but actually that those five 
could translate into 50 by each of them knowing 10 of it, ideally. Obviously, that's going to be like putting all our great, great grand masters on that canoe because none of, I don't know, even myself, I may have been ordained in two different schools. I still have eight. I don't ever think I will achieve all of those, <laughs> but it's a lifetime learning. Thank you. usually don't need this. Um, I'm struck personally by how much having uh, mobile phone navigation has changed my sense of geographically where I am and how I've sort of lost track in some sense when I'm in new territory. And I'm curious whether you use uh, mobile phone navigation to find the library at Stanford, that kind of thing, and whether and w what your reaction to it is. So I'm not uh, against technology. Uh, despite my learning in the indigenous way, I still think that there could be a possibility of meshing the two, getting being the best of both worlds, so to speak. And if I may just kind of like use myself as an, as an example to, to the first time that I arrived in San Francisco 30 years ago, when I came for my undergraduate study, the second day I was lost. The reason I was lost was that the person I stayed with took me to the wrong school, uh, which was UCSF. I was going to USF. But he told me, five o'clock, I'm going to finish work. I'll pick you up. I ended up being, I walked from UCSF Panhandle all the way to USF. And by the time I got there, it was too late. Long story short, I tried to call the number I came from Yap, that time we had four digits, four numbers, or eight digits, or seven. And every time I called those numbers, a machine talked back to me and I talked to it. Eventually I'm like, this person answering the phone is very rude. You know, it's, it's just, keep repeating the same thing, deposit, hang up, deposit 25 cents. Anyways, I've, I got lost essentially. And that was the first time I was, I found myself on Market Street, downtown San Francisco, and I thought I was in Mars. Like, oh, not, and then worse things happen. Never seen homeless people. But <laughs> long story short, the only thing I can think of was take me to San Francisco airport, which I managed to find myself there. And then I retraced the whole thing from the day before visually recognizing highway 101 overpass turning train tracks everything was replaying itself that's that's like normal i mean i think if you're brought up and learn indigenous navigation landmarks become very critical points for you of reference but to your question of whether technology and using uh, phones, I encourage that to my apprentices. And by the way, a big shout out to some of my apprentices and students who are listening in and those who are here too. I recognize, of course, some of the seafarers from my part of the world, including Pete Paris, who's back there, but and and Darian Day, who's a former graduate of the school. Um, I'm always advocating the need for, this is 21st century, and I want my apprentices to be able to use technology to their advantage. Now, having said that, stick with the traditional knowledge as best as possible. The GPS might die out, the battery might die. I don't think the stars will start falling anytime soon. It could, it could stay there for a while, but but the orientation in terms of using technology, if, if I may, I think it depends to your point of like changing your perception of navigation. It, it, I'd imagine if you know the ancestral way of navigating, and by that I mean being able to use the sun, the stars, the moon, I, I think it, it just helps you when you navigate using, 
I can tell you that when I first, that one thing that I always like want to do whenever I hit a point place is to look at bearings and get myself oriented. By night, I look at the stars. And during the day, I look at the sun. And then landmarks, so that it, navigation is becomes part of your journey. If I'm sorry if that was a long way around of answering that question. Yeah, I like to also share a little view from here. I, you know, I think uh, the modern navigational devices are very important. But to me, I think the process that you went through to learn the navigational skill, the traditional navigational skill, is very important. Makes you very humble, makes you very close to nature, to families, and to your colleagues. So, yes, a cell phone, of course, I'm carrying an Apple phone. But the process that we go through, it makes you in not only a man, but it makes you very, like I said, very humble. So I think that's also very important to add to that. We do have one online question, um, Q&A question that I wanted to reference. They wanted to know how you're working with the winds in how, what the traditional significance, sorry, significance of that is, what some of the names that you might use are. So winds for us comes from, you see all these points on the star compass. We have identified several wind directions, much like the wave patterns, which we also use. Um, we, we have, at least for me, we identify if I'm here, this is east, a wind that goes from here to the west and a wind that goes from north to the south and repeat those on the opposite direction. So you now have one, two, three, four wind direction. Now take 45 in between east and north. So we have this star, which we call Mund. That's where north northeast wind, trade wind, heading that direction. Likewise, southeast wind heading opposite direction and then take the opposite. Those are the prominent wind directions for us. And I can tell you in the part of the world where I come from, easterly and northeast wind is most prominent. So you would see a trade wind for us sailing down west, sailing into the wind again, as I explained, this asymmetrical canoe style. That's a little bit of a challenge, but we still manage, we still do. Now, on the point of wind, when the wind is in our favor, we sail. So we also have what we identified as fighting stars, as somebody likes to call it. I like to call it a falling star. And basically what that means is that when that star is at certain point of the horizon at any given day, because we have 20, 21 of them that we use. These are the stars that tells us weather patterns, stormy times. And we look at those stars to indicate to us when we should voyage. Because several things happen. We decide on two things. One, we either want to wait for that storm to come close so that we can go out halfway through and the wind hit us and take us in to the next destination. Or we wait until it passes us, we chase the tailwind and we ride it out. So timing of wind, windows of those winds is very critical for voyaging. And luckily for us, the ancestors have identified that we can predict them based on star locations throughout the year. That's 21 different potential storms that we could expect. It's not just storms. Some of them means wind. Some of them means waves. Some of them means you know, rain. <clears throat> but it helps us in deciding when we should voyage. If, if I should answer the question for wind, then yeah, for we know when we should be able to voyage throughout the year based on 
ancestral knowledge that have identified those periods. Having said that, climate change has made a lot of strange things happen. And we know that we also see the difference as that happened. Unfortunately for us, we are probably the least contributor to what's happening to climate change, but we are also at the very forefront of it, bearing the brunt of sea level rise on small islands as those. But worry not, I'm gonna sell my canoe to higher lands of California and settle here if that should ever happen. Um, <clears throat> I just like to add just a couple of sentences into that. You know, we have a word we call Khan Logalok. So Khan Logalok, Logalok is the, the stern of the canoe. So most of the, um, the, the Marshallese and navigator, navigators actually can feel the reflection of waves, the currents that comes through the islands. So they pretty much, and of course, the islands are so close to each other that you can kind of feel that, yeah, there's an island here. There's, you know, the island that I sailed from is here, the Camado, and this island that the, the, the incoming swells have um, bended. So they have that. So they kind of know where they are when they go toward the island. So uh, when the wind shifts the canoe or come from different direction, the reason why they use the word Khan Lagalak is they sit in the back and look at the uh, the back of the Alrika float and they would uh, kind of point out where the island is from the stern. And when they the island is close. I mean, it's in that right direction of the back of the Alberga float. Then they would they would chant the canoe and go toward that island. So even if you miss, you're close enough that you can coincide. So that's how, because most of the time you go out there, a lot of time the wind shifted on you. And of course, there is, you keep in mind that there is also currents and that you know, stir the canoes in a different direction. Hi, I'm Kennedy. Thank you guys for coming and sharing your uh, culture and history. I'm wondering, you guys have talked about the asking permission from the water and the lessons of humility and connecting to nature. And what are some of the spiritual lessons that have stuck with you through your time in seafaring? We let the elder start. Spiritual lessons. So every all ten, let me put it this way, they all are spiritual. I can link each one of those to a deity, so to speak. So in canoe carving, the master carver, that knowledge we believe came from Sennap, who's, who becomes a Sennap, but that Sennap has a name of that deity that originated, came in a form of a bird, you know? Some people identify him or her as Selang, and that's the spirit of canoe carving. For navigation, we call him Palulap or Elulue is that source. And so it goes down the list. They are all connected to the spirit world, so to speak. And in our teaching and in our learning, not only do we learn that skill in terms of applicability of the knowledge, that's the easy part. The hardest part is memorizing the chants and the prayers and the whatnot that are part of this exercise. So in voyaging, when we do our voyage, we better be sure that we are, first of all, protected. And by this, I mean, as navigators, we have our own protection that is herbal, mens, you know, that, that is being passed on for generations. So I inherit someone's. <laughs> and the reason that we do that 
is we believe that when we entered into these sacred realms, we are in the world of spirits. And it, we need to become protected because bad spirits could hurt us, harm us, or good spirit can also assist us, right? I'll give you well, like one of my curious things that I always ask my teachers when they teach me some of those chants. And I would ask like, could you tell me what the, this word means? Because I know it doesn't exist in our everyday talk. And the best answer they could give me is that they also don't know. However, he would tell me it doesn't matter. That's not ours. The tree, the ocean, the fish, that's their language. The ocean understands that. So the recipient of what we speak when it comes to that part understood perfectly what I'm asking. And essentially, most of the time, it's asking for blessings. It's asking for way, rite of passage. It's asking for all of those things that we want to. So <laughs> I don't know if I answer your questions on this spiritual component of this life system. But I can tell you that a lot of it is spirit to me and to those who practice it. When I first, I remember being in meeting with the elders, when one of the elders asked us, the younger ones then, do you believe that the ocean has years? And I was struck, I'm like, I would like to see his years. Yeah. But that elder said, I can assure you that ocean has years. I can tell you that ocean is alive. Much like the tree that you're about to cut down if you need to, to build a canoe, that tree is alive. And because it's alive, because it's living, anytime and every time you're going to use it, you better be sure that you enter that world and ask permission and do the right thing, you know? <laughs> Even though sometimes, as I said, I don't understand it. It don't matter. It's the receiving end that matters. And so I'm really seriously grateful that there is recognitions of ancestors of places like this. Because to me, it just gives me the assurance like, yes, we are not alone. You know, we are in places where we recognize that what we inherit actually belong to someone else before us, that we're just guardians. We're just people keeping this. And it's imperative on us to be able to transmit that because they transmit it. And we have a duty on ourselves to transmit to the next generation to be able to, to live. You know, I think part of the problems that we're losing to the point that Alson said earlier, even of the connection between the human being and the elements is can be lost. But I, I think that's where we retain those and understand that they play a vital role in what we carry with us, in what we deliver, what we do. You know, knowing <laughs> that on my island, there are only two occasions where your life matters on that island, even though there's only 200 people, 300 on that island. The first time that the island is going to come together for your sake is when you're born. And the second time it's going to come around is when you're sleeping forever. So I've always wondered, like, hey, how come you're partying for four days when I was born? The whole island mobilized for my sake. And when I'm going to die, you're going to mobilize again. If it's for me, how come I don't get to participate? You know, I don't get to eat that good fish. You know, it's somebody else's. But again, my teachers remind me it's not about you. It's what happened in between. That's your life. 
So you come into this world knowing that you can, as bearer and, and as people who retain, keep this knowledge, you can be sure that your best buddy is the one on this other side. You know? That's why when we do this stuff, when we voyage, we recognize that it could be the end. And that's quite okay with us. It's fine when we take on our voyages. It's not a problem to accept that death is your friend yeah, and stare it in the face and say, yes, I'm ready. I'm going to do this. Yeah. I have to try to see my family again. But if it happens, hey, that's okay. Everyone is going to go there. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long answer. Yes, please. I, yeah, let's, how about we handle it this way? Let's please join me in thanking Larry Nelson. And we'll, if you would be willing to have a few people come up and look uh, more closely, you're, you're welcome to uh, <laughs> Okay, and, and ask your questions as well. And we'll be around for some time. We don't have to be out of here for at least a, a, a few more minutes. Um, so please take your time to kind of engage with this, to ask the rest of your questions. And join me one last time in thanking um, Larry Nelson. Thank you.